Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to Arpedios LinkedIn Live. Here we talk about the account-based sales revolution. And today our theme is, of course, based on the famous book, Fearless, Sell More. It's a big pleasure to have you here today, Tom. And thank you for taking wow. the time. Thank you. I can hear the cheers and, and the applause resounding all over the world but I'm a delusional person, so it works really well in a studio setting like this. Thank you, Max. Um, yes, of course. I'm, of course. I admire you and I'm envious of your name. I always wanted to say to an attractive woman that I hope to date, my name is Maximilian. Maximilian. I was from wondering Europe. if you were free Saturday night. That was, I, that was the nickname you gave me in our first call, Maximilian from Monte Carlo. Yes, I, I just the white tuxedo. Black is for losers. White Next tuxedo, time. black bow tie. Hi, I'm Maximilian. You for, know, Tom, for, very mundane. For our next LinkedIn life, I, I, I make it happen. And you should. Tom, I, I, I want to kick it off. And, and um, let me kick it off this way. You, uh, you worked with, with big, big names like uh, Jay Leno, like uh, Jerry Seinfeld. You... Uh, we're part of a, of a group that uh, won an Oscar. You uh, are probably one of the su most successful um, executive recruiters out there. And uh, of course, you wrote a fantastic book. But you also once said, you said, it was a great introduction. It only missed an intermission. And um, I don't want you to leave this show and, and say, hey, Max did a great introduction. It only... It only well, Max, I, I have to get something off my chest. <laughs> when we talked, you said you would introduce me in a way that was complimentary. And I really feel that that was way too understated. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wanted something that was really laudatory and, and effusive and really and, underscored my greatness. And, and then you just came in with a couple of comments I'll let it go for now, but and, I really... And, and Tom, this is exactly why I, I would suggest you kick it off, you know, with the, with the brief <laughs> introduction to yourself. And uh, Oh, yeah, my gosh. And all right, I'm happy to, Max. In the background. I, Max, I'm a control freak. First of all, I want to say it's very exciting. I've done a lot of podcasts. And, you know, to be on a live show. And I'm assuming that I can't say, or I can't say... Or I can't say a whole bunch of things because we're live. Great censorship work, by the way, because, uh, you know, the way you bleeded those out. Uh, so, you know, my introduction, you know, uh, first of all, I'm not someone who doesn't need an introduction. You know, there are people, there's no introduction, Mohammed Ali. Uh, Tom Stern needs all the promotion he can get. And I'm constantly promoting. I, I'm sort of aligned as a salesperson and a marketer with the concept of Coca-Cola, which is Coca-Cola is ubiquitous. It's the most famous and probably generates the most revenue of any beverage in the world. I don't have the facts and figures in front of me. They do a ton of commercials. They never stop selling Coca-Cola. They never rest on their laurels. So there's a lot to be said for promoting yourself, but there's an art to it and you have to do it in a way that fits your personality. I Everything that we do, in my opinion, and which is why I think the psychology of sales is so important, is an extension of who we are and where we've been and how we've been raised and how we've succeeded and failed, our perception of our own character, and then our perception of other people's perception of us mm -hmm. to get a little meta on this. So I grew up in a family with a CEO who was very detached and aloof. And we had dinner every night and my mother had tremendous anxiety and was constantly just saying, you know, eat your vegetables, drink your milk before your water, do this. Don't, don't say like Tom, don't use the word like, just speak without the word like Tom, Tommy, Tommy. And it was nonstop. Tommy, 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 stop this. Don't do that. And my father just going, oh, oh this, this pie is, is excellent. That's an excellent pie. We used to joke that uh, he was so businesslike that every night we had his favorite dessert was apple pie chart, which he would cut into different pieces and then lecture us. And I would say, what are the crumbs? Love, Dad? Because there was not a lot of love because he just struggled with that. My point is, in an environment like that, I really had to work hard to be heard. 
-hmm. you know? And so from a very early age, without realizing it, I developed a highly assertive style of bringing attention to myself. And that's okay. And you build certain muscles, but having a consciousness that that's a habit, that it's connected to some psychological disimbalance because it was a dysfunctional family. It was a survival mechanism. Sometimes it's an asset. And sometimes if I'm in a fear place and I'm around people that are triggering this sense that I don't matter or that I can't be heard, I can go into hyperdrive mm -hmm. out of anxiety, push too hard, oversell and screw everything up. The mm -hmm. idea of fear less, sell more is not to obsess about fear, but uh, to recognize that it's a part of who we are. Um, I mean, we are biologically built to experience fear. Our amygdala, which is part of the metabolic chain, and it's in um, the reptilian part of your brain, is a command center that sends all the information down into the adrenal glands that pro produce in a fight or flight scenario cortisol, and that activates the system. And that's a biological anatomical reality that we need for survival. The problem is anxiety can keep that cortisol pumping all the time. And that has a deleterious effect on a whole bunch of levels. So how do we have a consciousness about fear since it is always there? You know, there's that line, Max, fear never sleeps. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say, if that's true, and maybe it is, I believe we can get fear to take a nap. So maybe it'll wake up again. Maybe we'll want it there at yeah. certain points in our life. But if we are interested in exploring who we are and I don't want to make this too metaphysical and taking chances and exploring the art of sales, which I believe is a performance art. Mm -hmm. We can find things to focus on that take our mind off of fear. And that's how you get it to take a nap. You understand it. You see its roots. I gave an example with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you relax a little bit, you turn yourself elsewhere and you say, thank you, fear. Glad you're there. If a wildebeest is ever attacking me on the savanna, I'm sure you'll be very helpful. But right now I'm going into a meeting and I want to focus on how I'm going to use my voice, how I'm going to express myself, what words will I choose, how much empathy am I capable of. And that focus will bring me into the moment and then I can perform and be artistic and creative and expressive. And to beat a dead horse just a little bit, again, kind of my style. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about someone on a high wire, which would be the most terrifying thing I could think of doing, mm -hmm. uh, even more than public speaking, which is supposed to have everybody freaked out. How do they do it? I mean, they're tempting fate and some of them die. They are so focused on the art of balance every muscle group, every twitch, every sense of the vista, where their eyes are, that they don't, not only do they not look down, they're not even thinking about how high up they are. They've given them, they've given themselves so many things to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I guess for them, it's pleasurable to have that much adrenaline and have that control. And in sales, it's a little bit the same way. I think people who have a lot of anxiety or experience anxiety at certain moments that's pretty heightened. Um, part of it is they want control. And in sales, there is that sort of shroud of Turin, that talisman that we're seeking to mm -hmm. create control. But it's so hard with all the variables, the clients, the comp competition, um, uh, the various trending that you have to keep up with, uh, your own personal stuff. So, we can only really influence and that's where the power of sales expression and what is so possible if fear recedes and the personal talents can come to the forefront and that's what interests me and um, yes thank you so much also um you touched up on 50 percent of the questions <laughs> Good. So I guess we're done. Thank you so much. I've appreciated yeah, being on the show. Right here. So of course, I, I, I wanted um, the audience at the beginning to have a better understanding of, of why you call sales a performance art. 
and 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 um, what you mean by that? But you already touched up on on on. Oh, this. but there's so much. No, I touched on it, but I I mean it's a great question. Please, I, I, please, I guess. Please go. I, I right. I'm curious. I want to hear more. And of course, I wanted to link this then to um to sales expression and and how sales leaders can can be more successful by being aware of of sales expression. Fine. Well, we're all making choices all yeah. the time, whether we realize it or not. I mean, I chose to, <laughs> and it comes naturally to me sometimes uh, to a fault, to speak at a certain pace, to just give what was probably a three to five minute speech um, at with a certain intonation. Uh, I chose to be a little playful at the beginning. Um, I did this quasi-intuitively. But, you know, it's the kind of thing I do normally. Well, I know you, Max, from a few conversations. I know why I'm on the show. Mm -hmm. And all of that coalesced my choices because you have a certain whimsy and glint in your eye and there's a sense of fun. Yeah. All of those choices might be terrible if I'm talking to a CEO who's under tremendous pressure and wants the facts wants to feel that I'm credible and can rely on me. So do I have the ability to pivot? Am I malleable? And how detailed and conscious of am, I am, am I when I make those choices? So when we make those choices, those intentions, those objectives, and these are all the language of the actor, we then put into play behavior. And that behavior is an expression of our instrument, which is the feeling, the sensual, sensorial senses, and the human voice. And the conveyor belt of those three then produces language, messaging, and the voice controls the intonation. And how do we get relaxed and intuitive and playful with all of that? I, I think that expression is, it starts with understanding your backstory the way any actor, most actors would approach a part. They would create a fictional backstory unless it's a biopic and they know the facts, but they would still nuance that. So they would create a backstory to know the character and then they would make choices and then they would experiment with those choices in how that person speaks, how they move, how they listen, where their strengths are. And I believe you can do this, and this is sort of counter to, sorry, I keep hitting the microphone. This is sort of counter to this intuitive, artistic, expressive concept, but it's counterbalancing. I have this idea of the inner corporation. So what you do is you take the pieces of yourself, the parts of yourself, And you create a kind of infrastructure so you're organized the way you would on your desk or your computer itself, the way documents are filed, etc., the way emails are red flagged. And you create the CEO, the vision, then you create that part that is the ensemble, all the different characters and parts of yourself that you can perform. Then you have the socially conscious part of yourself, um, that you have the chief consciousness officer, yeah. you have the marketing department, and all of these are interacting on some level. And you can do it after a period of time without thinking. You can literally write those parts out and make decisions and dialogues between the parts of the self when before you go into a meeting or while you're managing a process that's going on. All of these things can be very engaging. Otherwise, what you get is people who go, I had a good meeting. Ah, I was on. Okay, and you'll replicate that how? And why were you on? And mm -hmm. how much do you understand and what methodology brought you into the moment? Yeah. And to me, the methodology, as well as the results, are what's so compelling and sustaining about a sales career. I've been selling since I was three years old at the dining room table. I had to sell me. And, you know, I'm still doing it because it fascinates me, this art of communication and influence and how you can express yourself. So there are a lot of ways to do that. And we can talk about exercises and approaches. There's a lot to cover. 
but that's my philosophy. One thing I, I, I would like to pick up here um, is, is communication. And f for you, what, what is the key for a success in communication? I think it starts on the most primitive level, and that is the need to connect. Mm -hmm. Now, that may seem very obvious, and you know, I think anybody in sales or in life ideally wants to connect, but there are a lot of things that get in the way. Yeah. We experience a series of rejections. We start flinching. We get depressed. We get cynical. And we start thinking people aren't worth it, or I'm not good enough, or a series of cognitive errors that suddenly commandeer all our choices. And we're not really behaving like we want to connect. There are tons of people out there that want to connect, but they don't know how to behave that way. Or they behave that way, but they don't have a sense of how they did it, how they can do it again. Why was it so strong? Why was it so weak? So it starts with the need to connect and the understanding that fear, what does it do? It constricts blood vessels. Your body goes cold in certain areas when you're afraid. You have a biological response. Well, same thing with communication. It narrows everything. And you might hypertrack people's responses. You might start theorizing and coming up with paranoid notions about this person doesn't like me, or I think they said it this way. All of that may or may not be true, but it's obstructionist. How do we move forward with a positive intention? I want to connect. How can I be empathetic? What is the other person expressing to me? That's the other thing. This is a reciprocal process, this expression. That's how we, in quote, take cues from the other person. So communication is a reciprocal process, but that starts on the inside. How uninhibited are you? How sensitive are you? Mm -hmm. And how much do you need and want that connection? Uh, they give scripts to 100 salespeople in um, boiler rooms or in large departments and big companies and brokers, for instance. They all go out with the same script. How come only 20% of them hit the ball hard. Mm. It's the desire they had to convey that information, their need to connect with the other person. And that's the fundamental driver for influence. And I think selling is almost a misnomer. It's influencing. It's a softer word. It's a little more dignified. And um, I think it's a little less pressuring. Uh, but there are moments where we are selling. And a lot of times when I sell, by the way, I will frame it. Okay, I'm going to sell you now. And even that can create comfort. So yeah. how do we frame our communication to make other people comfortable? And this is not new ground in sales. What I do and have done and believe in is how we access the parts of ourselves that affect, drive, and improve all the things that allow us to connect from our eyes to our voice, to our body, to our imagination and to our ears. And for me, that's the key, wanting to connect, behaving in a way that enhances that connection and maximizing it. Nice, nice, yeah. And of course, if you're sitting in a meeting, you say, okay, now I'm selling, it actually can build like a, a certain trust, you know, a certain, it builds a certain transparency. I like it. And Tom, I have one more question before I would like to touch up on, on your uh, experience in, in search and recruiting. And um, one question, and, and this is where we really dive into, into the topic of today. Um, and I quote you here, you, you said in interviews, I have a PhD in fear. And uh, this is also reflected in, in the title of, of, of the book, which, of course, I, I really recommend people to read because um, I think it was a book that really gave you tools as a salesperson, you know? Uh, there are some, there are some sales, sales books you read and you have more questions afterwards than you had before. So I, I really appreciated the book. Um, and this quote, 
I, I have a PhD in fear. Um, when you look at salespeople, if, 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 if you look at someone who, who um, really um, has severe anxiety, how can one overcome this and, and achieve sales success? I really want to answer that question. It's an excellent question, but as a kind of caveat to uh, broaden the concept of my book, yeah. this book is for people certainly who have extreme anxiety. A lot of times the tendency is, is to think, well, what Tom's doing is good for beginners because mm -hmm. they're so scared. Mm -hmm. Hey, I was in the top of my profession and have been for almost 30 years, top 1% of sole proprietors recruiting and professional services. I'm a seven figure guy on average through 30 years. I am still scared. I still have anxiety. I still can get depressed. I still can lose faith in myself. So this idea that fear has to be extreme for us to address it, I think um, is a misnomer. We should be proactive or that it's only the province of the neophyte, the beginner. So, you know, first of all, identifying what you're afraid of and how you're expressing that fear or how that fear is limiting you. Let me give you an example. I was trying to coach somebody very accomplished. And he'd gotten where he'd gone as an operations person, in part, besides his skills, the way he communicated was highly credible in terms of organization. You felt like, well, every folder's in line, every number has been evaluated. But his communication style was, da -da 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 -da. we've looked at this and now we see this. And we also talked over here, and now we know it's this. And we've assessed that, and we don't, don't, bump, 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 bump. And not only was it dull after a period of time, but it created no personal connection. It was sort of robotic. So, you know, I think that it really compromised his ability to influence and to lead. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at things musically. Take the words away, and what are the rhythms of your talk? And why are you dropping at the end? because that's sort of the end. That fact has been addressed. Let's now move to the next fact. And I tried to work with him and say, there's so many other patterns and expressions that you could be using in your speech where you bring enthusiasm, where you bring a foreboding sense that what you've found is something of high consideration. And being neutral is one note. It's a scale that is essential to your credibility in operations, but it's not essential as the only communication tool for building relationships. Everyone is influencing, everyone is selling, because everyone needs to make a connection, because all of business is collaborative. And, you know, I just don't know how else to put it. So you have to determine and be willing to look at yourself. Mm -hmm. Most people who have extreme anxiety besides just being overwhelmed by it, and it's very painful at times, sometimes they fall into the mode of victim. You know, well, this person is doing this to me. My boss is mean to me, or I had something happen in my childhood. Uh, the question is, oh, I think that's my cell phone. Well, that's annoying. <laughs> Hi, Steve. I'm in the middle of an international interview. Greetings, <laughs> Steve. Well. And please don't ever call me again. So anyway, um, but uh, so, you know, I think, again, going to the inner corporation, the yeah. CEO can be reassuring, doesn't have to be a command and control CEO. And that says to you, we're afraid. Let's sit down. Let's have a board meeting about the fear. What are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? Are you catastrophizing? Uh, let's let's bring in accounting on this. Uh, what are the numbers that you're afraid of? Let's bring in marketing. Um, are you terrified to promote yourself? Let's look at the ensemble of parts of yourself that can express what ones are dominating. Are they causing problems? Are you too extroverted, too needy, too much of a people pleaser? And how does that come through in your voice and in your words? Are you too, are you kind of dead because the fear is taking all the lifeblood out of you? And, and you really have to get the landscape. And just that commitment to looking at yourself, 
Just saying, I'm going to look at myself. Well, you've already taken your mind off your fear and you've taken control. I'm not a victim of my fear. I'm not a victim of my boss, my past, uh, the exigent and urgent circumstances that I may be struggling with because I just took a positive action to take control of what I can manage. And that one decision already should reduce fear. Then you break it into its parts, you digest it, and then you eliminate it the way you would uh, food. And I love to refer to toilets and uh, bowel movements. I think it's important in all teaching to turn it into bodily functions, but that's another conversation. <laughs> and Tom, we are, we are kind of reaching an, an end here. Um, I have two more questions left for you. I'm amazed that you've been able to get more than one question out. Generally, when I'm interviewed, it's like, Tom, welcome to the show. And that's the last thing the person says. I'm, I'm and then all I hear is, Tom, we're out of time. Please, <laughs> what else would you like to ask me? Um, one question is, is um, kind of tying into um, your, your experience and your, your career in, in search and recruiting. And um, I would like to, to understand what um, you, you learned in, in, in that time when it comes to sales leaders and maybe to be a bit more precise, um, in your opinion, what makes a good sales leader? Well, you mean someone who's managing other salespeople? Yes, 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 exactly. Oh, well, I, you know, it's important that I be transparent. I've run mm. tiny organizations and the only people that I've managed have been Uh, you know, researchers and people yeah. doing some uh, candidate sourcing for me. So my experience as a manager is, is, is narrow compared to a lot of people who are out there with huge departments or, you know, a large span of control, etc. So, you know, what I would say is if you have a sense of humor about yourself mm -hmm. and you have empathy for yourself, which is very critical in overcoming fear, you can't shame yourself. You have to be very understanding. And I would say to myself, Tom, sit down, let's look at this. This is tough. All of that empathy, sense of humor, perspective about who we are and how we express ourselves has to come through in anybody you're trying to lead. Mm -hmm. And then it's giving them feedback. This doesn't just work with people you lead. This works with potential clients yeah. where I sort of call it the psychic hotline. But if somebody works for you over time, you have a lot more data. Mm -hmm. And that's telling them what you see. You know, when you're talking to me right now, what I see is a lot of defensiveness. Here's how you started introducing negative information like, well, I could have done better if, or it's not my fault. And I'm thinking, well, nobody said it was. So right away, I'm going to zero in on you sound defensive. Yeah. And let's talk about that. Because if you're taking that out into the marketplace, that's going to hurt you. And that's going to also debilitate you just when you're on your own. Your thoughts, your feelings are going to move to the darker side. So you don't want to be a psychologist. You're going to be a psychologist. You're not a therapist. But in the moment, vis-a-vis -vis sales, you can give strong feedback. Here's what I'm in your voice, what I'm hearing today. How can we move out of this kind of dead vocal pattern you're in? How can we get you some energy? What's in the way? What are the thoughts that are sapping your vitality from you? I think it's very personal. Developing personal relationships, getting the trust of that individual. They know you care. And then allowing you as the sales leader to really know them. Once you know the person you're leading, you can understand what they need to get them focused on the mutual goal. Nice. And, and, and Tom, this, this answer actually already ties a bit into, into the next question. If you have one main, main learning, one, one key takeaway for, for salespeople, what would it be? Uh, get another job. You know, I think it's time to move on. It's a horrible career. Uh, it's filled with anxiety, tremendous amount of rejection, uncertainty. Uh, if you're on commission, you can end up making nothing. Uh, really, uh, Lay down brick, uh, work in a toll booth. Anything is better than sales. But seriously, uh, I think sales is such an adventure. 
you know, you're not managed in the same way. I mean, you're kind of let loose into the marketplace mm -hmm. and you live one conversation at a time, one interaction at a time, and you get to shape the scripts that you use and you get to adapt and improvise. So to me, it's a performance art. And anytime you're involved in something that has an artistic component, a nuance, an expression, it's sort of limitless what you can learn and explore and change and grow. And you don't have to be Madonna or the male equivalent and have a new hairstyle every month. It's more about playing with your persona. And there are a lot of exercises that you can do, which we haven't had time to talk about, but study broadcasters. Look at the ones you like and don't like. Who are they? How do they convey who they are immediately? What is their vocal tone, their choice of language? Anderson Cooper is a lot different from Don Lemon. Sean Hannity is different from both of them or whoever you watch, but watch a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just part of the choosing, the understanding and the expressing that makes sales um, an infinitely fascinating gig. And if you get real good at it, you can make more money than, you know, all the people around you. And then you can gloat and alienate them, end up alone and reread my book and try to maybe piece your life back together. But too much success is a quality problem. So let's just focus now on enjoying sales and the journey and the adventure. Tom, I, I enjoyed it very much today with you. Um, I'm, I'm about to wrap it up. It was amazing. Thank you so much for, for joining you. us. If, if people want to get a hold of you or find out more about, about Tom Stern, where, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, uh, you know, get a hold of me, hopefully for reasons that are constructive. Um, you know, don't try to sell me property in Florida that's, you know, on a landfill. Uh, my email is tom at sternexec.com. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to dialogue with anybody uh, who's interested in this subject and my approach and strategy. And I'd love to be helpful. Nice. And uh, yeah, maybe we, we throw it also in, in the comments. And yeah, Tom, big pleasure. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, I think we learned a lot about, about sales today, about how sales can be seen as a performance art, sales expressions, uh, why communication is so key, how to uh, fear less and sell more. So it has been a big pleasure. Um, make sure to follow our PD on LinkedIn. We'll be back with LinkedIn Live in August, I believe. So uh, make sure to, to uh, follow us and, and stay updated. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.